Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, the show about uh, global citizenship in our networked age in early 2021. Uh, an episode or two ago, I, I had a conversation with the very well-known Canadian writer, Margaret Atwood. Um, uh, Atwood had received um, an award uh, for global citizenship um, from the Canadian Institute for Citizenship, um, uh, an Adrian Clarkson Award. Uh, and we began, when I talked to uh, Atwood, talking about global citizenship. Uh, today, I want to begin again on the theme of global citizenship. And today, uh, my guest uh, is a woman who I think is, a, is truly a global citizen. And I want to explore what that does, should, and shouldn't mean to her. Her name is uh, Nanjala Nyabala. I hope I pronounced that right. She's a, a Kenyan uh, political activist, writer, political philosopher. Um, Nanjala, um, what does the idea of global citizenship mean to you? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, for me, global citizenship means having a sense of belonging and a sense of um, rights, if you will, from the society that you live in. I think that's like the core definition of citizenship. And I think a global citizen is a person who sees themselves as part of a broader tapestry of the human existence, as a person who thinks of themselves as um, not just having rights to live in the world and to be in the world, but also having, I guess, a set of obligations that come with that, including you know, caring for the natural environment, um, caring for how your actions and the actions of others impact people who you might not necessarily see um, on a day-to-day -day basis, might not be right in front of you, but um, who will live with the consequences of the choices that you make. Um, a global citizen is a person who always sees themselves as part of a bigger story. Nangela, fit yourself into that narrative then. Uh, your new book is entitled Traveling While Black. And not only are you a political activist, a, a legal scholar, but you're also in some ways a professional traveler. You spend a lot of time on the <laughs> road. Uh, what does that mean in terms of this ideal of global citizenship? Well, one thing that constantly comes up is the idea of equality and access. Um, and part of the reason why the book deals with questions of race and questions of identity is that travel really puts into relief some of the things that are, some of the inequalities that are built into the logic of the system that we live in now. And some of the things that make it difficult, if not impossible for people to see themselves as global citizens. So I think about, I write a little bit about visas, for example, and people take for granted that visas exist and everybody has to apply for a visa. And it's, it's and a lot of people from the West think that it's an easy thing that you just kind of go take your papers and, and get stamped. But for people from the global South, like myself, people who don't have Western passports, um, getting a visa is a, is there's so many humiliations and, and um, challenges that are built into that. And, they are deliberate, they're political choices, they're policy choices that have been made because the assumption is that when people who are, you know, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America are trying to go to Europe or trying to go to some certain parts of Asia that they are um, unwelcome. The presumption is of being unwelcome before being welcome. And so then the visa system becomes loaded with all of these, for example, a Nigerian woman trying to go to Thailand has to get a letter from her closest male relative, either a father or a husband. Um, the list of requirements for visas for Nigerian women trying to go to Dubai, to the United Arab Emirates is almost two A4 pages long. Um, we, to get a long-term visa to go to the United Kingdom, you have to submit, if you have a Kenyan passport, you have to submit a year's worth of bank statements. There are all of these intrusions and, and things that are coming from that core presumption which is difficult to capture in the language of policy, right? Because we're so accustomed to trying to frame these things as sterile bureaucratic uh, uh, decisions, but actually they're very loaded. And so these questions of the inequalities that are built into the global travel and global um, uh, 
global travel regime. These are things that I think merit a deeper insight because they really do stand in the way of a lot of people, millions of people thinking about themselves as being part of this global citizenship. Yeah, the, the, the idea of global citizenship has a, a kind of, I guess, fetish amongst progressives in the West. The idea of living anywhere or everywhere simultaneously, of being on and off planes, of, of living part of one's life in Thailand and another part in um, <laughs> Kenya and another part in London or New York. But of course, as you're say, suggesting for, for, for other people, uh, global citizenship is 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 entirely unrealistic. Um, yeah. Particularly the poor, the powerless, for better or worse, mm -hmm. they are tied to soil, aren't they? And the walls are getting higher. Not only are they tied to specific ge geographies, specific to tied to the soil, as you put it, but the walls are getting higher and higher. It's become almost impossible. Like legal um, travel for a lot of people in the world has become almost impossible. The last 30 years, I would say probably since the end of the Cold War, we've seen this tremendous spike in, um, you know, making international travel especially difficult for poor people, but incredibly easy for wealthy people. So mm. for example, for 450,000 euros, you can buy EU citizenship. And a lot of wealthy people do. They will buy citizenship to Malta, in, to Cyprus. In, in Malta, yes. Yeah, Malta, Cyprus, uh, Portugal even. And um, that allows you to opt out of the indignities that maybe as someone who has the same passport as you, uh, or who was born in the same country as you would have to endure. and. So there's this two tier system that's emerging as you pointed out. There's, well, even three tiers because then there's all of us in the middle who are sort of um, trying to navigate the extremes. But you have this tiered system whereby rich people, people with power are putting in place all of these restrictions on human mobility and then opting out of them and then operating above them and never having to endure the indignities that other people are being subjected to. I think it's crazy to me that right now, I think last week we had another um, uh, boat capsizing, 40 people a day, 50 people a day, 90 people a day, dying in the Mediterranean Sea, numbers that wouldn't even change the demographics of a small town, but they're being allowed to die when, you know, the citizenship, EU citizenship can be bought. Yeah, it seems to be what, what you're suggesting is that geography, rather than economics or geography as a consequence of economics is, is the key to making sense of this two-tiered uh, or three-tiered democratic system in the world today. Geography then is so political, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's geography and it's identity because I'll get one example that comes to mind is the difference between how white South Africans encounter the United Kingdom and how black South Africans encounter the United Kingdom. And, you know, we have a significant white population in Kenya, colonial families that never left. And the, the difference between how those families experience the United Kingdom and how everyone else experiences the United Kingdom, they are often exempt from a lot of the restrictions that the rest of us have to deal with. You'll say, well, you know, this person, his great grandfather was a British um, Earl. And so it's okay for them to have this second passport. And we say, well, when he was being a second, uh, generation or fourth generation, whatever, Earl, what was he doing in Kenya? He wasn't here on holiday. He was here as part of an oppressive architecture. Um, and so to give that exclusion is, is a deeper political commentary, I think that people are very uncomfortable with. But um, yes, as you say, it is a function of geography and economics. And um, we assume increasingly that people who have money, there's an inherent worthiness or goodness there that makes it make sense for them to be um, treated differently from people who don't have money. You've been a, an outspoken critic of the, the, the refugee situation between Africa and Europe and in Africa generally. Uh, it's always seemed to me somewhat ironic given the nature of this show, which is about democracy. Uh, the first, uh, in our first series, I went to Athens and the islands, uh, to, uh, to do some filming around the, the antiquities of democracy. It's always been very ironic, it seems to me, that Greece has been one of the, the choke points, to use an ugly word, 
when it comes to Africans trying to get uh, North Africans and, and Sub-Saharan Africans, tr and indeed uh, people from the Middle East trying to get into Europe. Yeah. Um, is that just coincidental? Do you think that the, 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 the poor, um, the people without uh, soil, uh, the persecuted, they're trying to get into Europe through Greece, the birthplace of ancient democracy? Well, I mean, part of it is, is a function of, as you said, geography. The, the people make the, the Mediterranean, as I, as I write in the book, is a very unpredictable sea and it's very changeable. In one, you know, 30 minute, it could go from very calm to capsizing. Um, and so people try to cross at the narrowest points. And so for a long time, it used to be the Western route, which is between Therta and um, uh, Spain and Gibraltar, sort of that side of, of things. And then that sort of shifted to the other side with the rise, the conflict in Syria and Iraq, the conflicts in Syria and Iraq. Um, so people crossing into Turkey and then sort of trying to cross the, the straits and, and sort of get um, across to Greece. And then that sort of got choked off. And now we have people trying to make the most dangerous crossing, which is between Libya and Italy, because it's the longest distance between um, Northern Libya and, um, so it's, it's partly a function of geography, but there is something to what's happening in Europe that makes, that is making the outcomes in Greece go exactly the way they are. And part of that is to do with Greece finding itself at the periphery of the European Union as a political project. I find, I find it very interesting because I read European politics kind of from a, a slightly removed place in the sense that it's, it's the dynamics are 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 fascinating because I think what it is is that a lot of the countries Greece, Hungary, um, and increasingly Serbia are almost using the migration or the refugee crisis as a way of reasserting themselves in a context in which the European Union power has shifted so much to the West, in particular Germany and France, and there are decisions that are being made that a lot of politicians in Greece and Serbia and Hungary is a slightly different case, but certainly in Greece are kind of trying to get some measure of reciprocity because um, when the first groups of people arrived, uh, the Greeks, I think, did try to accept people. They did try to have sort of an, an open uh, humanitarian policy. And then the policy from Europe Frontex was no that we have to have this hard border because it's part of our European migration policy. And then sort of the Greeks were like, well, then you have to help us. You have to help us, um, you know, be manage this situation. And there's been a little bit of tension around that about not getting it, the, the kind of help that they need. But symbolically, I think that you're right. I think that uh, symbolically, there is something about how Europe broadly positions itself as a caretaker or a promoter of democracy and is working so hard and literally allowing people to die um, every week in the name of strong borders. And Greece, this birthplace of democracy, then becomes this fulcrum, this, this mm. you know, point at which this whole debate is pivoting in, in real time. So there's definitely I think a really powerful symbolism in that. I think it's particularly uh, ironic, I'm not even sure if that's the right word, certainly tragic, that Greece, the birthplace of uniting the notion of citizenship with soil mm -hmm. through the polis, which was the foundations of the democracy mm -hmm. of antiquity, now has become the place that people without citizenship, mm -hmm. without soil, uh, citizens of nowhere, and Angela, what's it like to be a refugee? What's it like to be somebody without citizenship? Well, well one of the short essays that I, I, I wrote to try and illuminate this question doesn't seem that way on the surface, but that was the thinking behind it was about Bessie Head. And Bessie Head is, was an amazing South African writer who was a victim of the apartheid regime and ended up leaving South Africa in 1967 on what is called an exit pass. And exit passes were given to black, um, but also to anybody really who was anti-apartheid 
And it meant that you gave up your South African citizenship and you couldn't come back. It was a way of getting rid of their critics. And so she left South Africa on an exit pass to Botswana and spent the next uh, 15 years, no, 17 years as a refugee in Botswana. So she didn't have Botswanan citizenship. And the, the essay basically tries to capture that day-to-day -day frustration of not being able to claim some of the very banal aspects of citizenship that we might take for granted. When you are able to travel without seeking authorization, even within the country. So right now, Somali refugees, actually all refugees living in Kenya, to live in a city, they have to get a special authorization document from the government. And we take it for granted as citizens that you can just get on a bus and take that bus three hours to go somewhere and you know, maybe go camping or go hiking, whatever, but they can't do that. That very basic ability of circulating freely within a specific, not, you're not even trying to go abroad just trying to go you know two hours down the road that doesn't exist for a lot of refugees for millions of refugees in the world so these people Very don't basic. exist it's like living in a, no. in, a, in, a, in a in a short story by Franz Kafka absolutely it's very 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 Kafka -esque. like you are bureaucratically you don't exist but physically you do exist and in a world that where in which increasingly the bureaucracy is the be all and end all of your, your entitlements, your existence, your everything, to not exist bureaucratically starts to frustrate you, your existence, your physical existence. And I think that's the, that's the space in which refugees live nowadays is we have denied them the right to exist in paper, um, on paper, um, but there's a, there's a tension, there's, a, there's an intellectual tension there because they exist, they're people, they, we can see them. Um, and in that tension rises a lot of violence, a lot of exploitation, a lot of exclusion. Refugees in Kenya have a hard time studying. Um, in the UK, refugees, people who are recognized as refugees, not even asylum seekers, live on the equivalent of 30 pounds a day, which is probably about what, 40, $50 a day, a week, not a day, a week. Um, but they're not allowed to work and they're not allowed to seek other forms of income. They just have to wait for those handouts, which are increasingly smaller and smaller. So there is a, there is a, yeah, I think Kafka is the perfect adjective for it. What do you make of the shift towards ethnic authoritarianism in, in countries as diverse as uh, the Philippines, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Hungary. the United States, and Brazil. Uh, this, this, this fear of the other, this hostility to anyone who doesn't share your skin color, your religion, your ethnicity. Yeah. And the way in I which it seems to be eating away at democracy. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic point. And that's one of the things that I grapple with in fact, in both of my books from different entry points, because I live in a society whereby we've seen almost in the last, since the arrival of colonization till today, we have witnessed this transition of the ethnic identity from something that is very fluid and very changeable to something that is very hardened and is almost like the be all and end all of the political entity, but in a way that excludes, for example, women. So for example, as a woman, when you marry, you lose your ethnic identity. Um, you take on the ethnic identity of your, of your, of your husband. So there's a, a gender tension in there, but overall, I think what's happening is that the way in which we've structured our national and global economies promotes competition rather than collaboration. And so, there is an illusion of scarcity, but we're, we're there's scarcity, but we're, it, we're focused on the wrong thing. People think that it's money that's scarce, but it's not money that's scarce. It's, it's natural environment. There isn't enough stuff for all of us to live middle-class American lives. And so money has become a, a proxy for a lot of other things that we should be thinking about. And that illusion of scarcity makes people fall back on theories of 
um, community and collaboration and, and working together that are the most malleable. The things that will fit into as many contexts as possible in order to advance their individual and uh, sort of their, to help them navigate that individual illusion of scarcity. What I mean by that is this, that if I'm thinking about my survival within our national environment, and I think that there, I sense or I feel that there isn't enough stuff for me to survive, but I know that I can't survive on my own, I have to recruit other people to help me navigate that. But I don't want to recruit so many people that my pie gets too small. And that's what ethnicity does because it's such a malleable thing. It is anything that you define it to be. In Kenya, uh, you know, an ethnic identity, it's not tied to any physiological characteristics. It's not tied to anything that you can say, you know, um, they were all born in this particular town, at least not today, maybe historically. So it can be anything and it can be something that is used to mobilize, to rally people around an idea that can be used to get people worked up in order to defend themselves against this illusion of scarcity. And I think that's what's happening in a lot of these societies is that people are resigned to the idea that we're not gonna try and be equal. We're not gonna try and be just. We're not gonna try and be inclusive. We're going to rally ourselves around in order to protect our scarcity, this idea of an identity that is so malleable and is so changeable. Um, sometimes when you, you obviously don't want to say this to people because you don't want to antagonize them unnecessarily. But when you think about how people define some of these ethnic identities, it blows your mind. You know, some people are fighting over groups that didn't even exist, like historically didn't exist. We have an ethnic group in Kenya that was created by the 1948 census by the United Kingdom, by the British colonial administration, because they wanted to reward a, a chief who had been um, uh, an ally, you know, had helped suppress neighboring communities. So they took these people in this one group who in the 48 census were counted as separate ethnic groups. And in the 52 census counted them as part of this bigger ethnic group as a reward. Today, those people fight <laughs> and they fight for this ethnic. And you're like, well, but you didn't exist as an identity 50 years ago, 60 years ago. What does it mean to be Hungarian in the ashes of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Prussia? Like how far do you back do you have to go? So um, that in my that to me is what's happening here is that we are living in a time whereby inequality is so dramatically increased that people are really anxious that there isn't enough stuff in the world for everybody to be okay. And the ethnic, the ethnic identity is becoming a rallying point to justify not just exclusion, but sharing whatever meager resources you think with a smaller group. Uh, Nanjala, in our first series, uh, I spoke to the Stanford University scholar of democracy, Larry Diamond, perhaps mm. the world's most authoritative scholar on democracies around the world. And while he was very pessimistic about American democracy, uh, Polish, Hungarian democracy. He was optimistic about some of the uh, newer democracies in Africa. Uh, very briefly, and I know Africa is a huge continent. I don't mean to, um, I, I don't mean to mm. undermine it in that sense. But could you give me a, a, a snapshot of the state of democracy uh, in Africa? Are there trends? Are you? optimistic about the progress of democracy in Africa? You know, one of my favorite things, uh, that, well, not favorite, one of the things that I learned in law school that has stayed with me forever is 90% of people obey 90% of the laws 90% of the time. And so when we think about sort of Africa as an idea, we tend to focus on the 10% where things are kind of not going well, or things are going so spectacularly well. There's always, we're always focused on the 10%. And the 90%, which is, you know, less exciting, less <laughs> dramatic, less 
Um, this is like everyday decision making, that of getting closer, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing, is much harder to think about. And so I would say that right now in the world globally, and again, not just in Africa, things are difficult. And I think that the pandemic has made things more difficult. I think that there are a lot of countries that have been taken, have been tested by the pandemic. Do we have sufficient global health structure, public health structures? Do we have, should we be using policing as part of the public health? What does it mean that we are facing a health crisis and the only thing we can think to do is police, you know, is beat people and things like that. And a lot of countries are failing, but there are a number of things that have happened that I think are worth paying attention to. One is I think Africa has shown the world what successful regional organization could look like. I think the Africa CDC has been outstanding in terms of acquiring vaccines, in terms of helping weaker countries get, get like, access to information, access to vaccines. I think the regional coordination in Africa has been a point of hope because it, it has allowed um, the benefits of such you know, institution building to be diffused across the continent. And then I think that there are a number of countries that have been, that have really risen to the challenge. Um, you know, I think of Senegal, and I think of Tunisia, and I think of, um, you know, countries that might not think about when you think, I mean, even in the news, how often does Senegal show up in the news? How often does Tunisia show up in the news? How often does Seychelles, Seychelles has vaccinated 65% of its population in the last three weeks. How often does that show up in the news? How often, we always mm, skip over them. Um, uh... <laughs> We, uh, a, a, a couple of shows ago, we had the Canadian uh, digital activist, uh, Bianca Wiley on the show. I know um, uh, you're, you've done a lot of work on the promise of um, the digital revolution. One of your books was called Digital Democracy, Analog Politics. Again, some Western thinkers have looked at Africa um, as the the new beginning when it comes to the digital revolution. Can digital allow Africa to somehow catapult over all the problems of 20th and early 21st century life? Can digital restore democracy to Africa? No, <laughs> that's the easy answer. No, I think one of the things that digital democracy analog politics is about is about the friction between the illusion of what the digital can do and the reality of what life is. And, and the, I, I, the book is about Kenya, not just because I am Kenyan, but because Kenya is one of those countries that has done the quote unquote leapfrogging. We have the, we're the world leader in mobile money we are the, in terms of transactions, uh, mobile money transactions amount to the equivalent of one third of GDP the last three years running. We have, I think 89% mobile penetration. Um, you know, like could, people are connecting to the internet at a rate that is completely unprecedented for a developing country. And our first digital election was a disaster. Our current use of digital in the education system has been a disaster. And that is to say, that is the tension that the book is exploring. The digital cannot fix what people don't want to fix offline. And more than thinking about Africa as sort of the West is on one end, uh, China is in the middle and Africa is trailing. Actually, if you, when it comes to digital, a lot of the things that the, uh, the West is struggling with now we've been struggling with for the last 10 years because of the leapfrogging. What's the role of technology and electoral politics? We've had our first digital election in 2013. All of these companies that have been interfering in American politics, they tested their, their strategies in Kenya in 2011, in Nigeria 2015. Um, so we have lessons to teach the world. And that's why I wrote the book because I kept having these conversations where people were like overlooking the fact that 
there's agency, there's human agency, there's political agency embedded in the way technology is used. And so my main argument from that book uh, is always, you cannot understand the role that technology will play in public life and political life if you don't understand the society first. It's not always going to be the same. Uh, Facebook bans uh, Donald Trump in the United States the same week that they ban Yoweri Museveni in um, Uganda. Nothing happens, nothing much happens in the United States. In fact, there's a big sigh of relief. But in Uganda, um, the government switches off the internet for three weeks and people die <laughs> um, because the, there's a big wave of reprisals against opposition activists. So that's really the main argument that I would make there is that tech isn't going to do anything that people don't make it do. It's, there's decision making, there's agency, there is human action that is part of the equation. Nangela, I, I don't want you to speak on behalf of Africa. That would, of course, be absurd. But um, <laughs> what does the Chinese model of this seemingly efficient authoritarianism, this digital surveillance society coming into being, what does it look like from Africa where many countries and politicians and people are looking for a model, an economic model that works in the 21st century? Um. The China question. Look, the, I, exactly. I think the a lot China of- China <laughs> question. It always comes up, doesn't it? It does always come up. And I think um, there is, whenever this question comes up, you always sort of have people who play at the extremes that China is going to save Africa by you know, providing all of these loans that with no um, conditionality and they're going to build all of these things and they're building roads and all of that stuff. And then you have the other extreme of, you know, China is, is a harbinger of doom and, and they are destroying Africa and, and all of that stuff. And I think both of those things are true. And I think that is part of the problem. Because what a lot of Western analysts, politicians, governments are worried about is not so much that China is exploiting Africa and Africans, it's that they don't get to exploit China, they don't get to exploit African Africans. It's that the West, Europe sees, especially, but you know, the United States as well, sees Africa as a natural logical extension of their um, empire, you know, contemporary empires, and that China is sort of eating into the turf. But what that tension does is that it abandons Africans. That a lot of the, the, the pushback, the conversation, whatever, is not centered on the well being of Africans, but on the geopolitical, geostrategic interests of both China and the West. So I'll give you an example. Um, in Zimbabwe, when the economy collapsed, Zimbabwe had been stuck in this very long running battle between the former colony Britain and you know, former President Mugabe. And at independence in 1918 Zimbabwe, 11% of the population, that is white Zimbabweans owned 80% of the land in the country, in an agricultural country. So the vast majority of Zimbabweans were locked out of land ownership. It became a point of political rallying for Mugabe and his whole strategy of getting land given back to black people was funded as part of the post-colonial um, reparations until the British decided to stop funding it. So now they're stuck in this geopolitical struggle and then in comes China. We don't care, we're not colonialists, we've not been here that long. You want a road, we build your road. You want an airport, have an airport. You want this, have this surveillance state, you want to monitor people, whatever. And so the Zimbabwean person is stuck because they do want access to land. The disenfranchisement, the historical disenfranchisement and, from land is a genuine colonial grievance, but they don't want to be part of this police state. And they don't want a government that cannot keep hospitals running and schools running and provide medicines to have the capacity to collect your data, to monetize your data, to sell your data. And nobody's really making that argument, right? Because again, it's about this clash of interests and not the interests of the people. 
And that is, that is the, the challenge of trying to find a constructive way to engage with China because people either want to pretend that there isn't a lot of bad stuff that's happening or they want to pretend that the bad stuff that's happening doesn't echo what the West has been doing in Africa for the last 60, 70 years. There are no clean hands in the debate. And so as Africans, as people who live here and who pay taxes here, we get forgotten. Uh, l- let's end, uh, Nanjala, where we began with the idea, the ideal, the promise uh, of global citizenship. You suggested, I think, at the beginning of the interview that global citizenship was a privilege of, of, of the wealthy, mm-hmm. of the well-connected, of the powerful. Dream a little bit for me to end this conversation. Um, how can we open up global citizenship to ordinary people, mm-hmm. to the people who, who aren't privileged in economic or cultural or racial mm-hmm. or gendered terms? I think that we have to recenter personhoods in the way that we think about the point of the systems that we build. I think that we have to start with the welfare of people in the way that we think about, you know, why do we, why are we building the state system? Why are we building this? And not just the people who have the citizenship of that country, but, you know, as a global conversation. I think we go, I think for me, the argument that I, I sort of try to make is let's bring values back into the conversation that we're having about the point of national, domestic, international politics. Let's just go back to basics. What's the point of all of this? It's so that, you know, Hobbes, Locke, we are better off living in a society than we are out of it. We are better in the state of man than than we are in the state of nature. Okay, if that's the basis then, Um, what values will allow us to protect that benefit on a global scale? And I think once we start thinking about values like justice, equality, inclusion, uh, respect, um, a lot of these things that we are treating as gray areas suddenly become a lot more black and white. And and that makes the decision-making process in terms of policies and in terms of um, uh, structures much easier than I think people are, are pretending that it is right now. So let's go back to basics and start with what values do we want our global society to be or our global citizenship to aspire to and, and then start you know, orienting ourselves back to that. Going back to basics, perhaps as, as, uh, as Nanjala Nyabala is suggesting in our new a uh, global world, we need a new global social contract, update locks and hobs for the 21st century. And Angela, a real pleasure and an honor, a wonderful interview. Keep well and um, love to have you back on how to fix democracy in the not too distant future to talk more about all these important issues. Thank you so much. Thank you.